So let me say good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. No, I said let me say good morning to you. <laughs> Stand to your feet. <clears throat> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Your wonderful Father, you're marvelous. You're righteous and holy. You are everything for us and to us. Our words could never describe the greatness of the Lord God Almighty. Our words could never explain the height, the depth, the width, and the breadth of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we are inadequate to describe, Heavenly Father, your holiness, your beauty, your worthiness of all of our praise and thanksgiving. But we come before you now, and we ask you, Father, to look into our hearts. Search us, Father. And what you see there that's not in keeping with you and your standards, point it out so we can empty ourselves of those things. And then, Father, fill us up. I ask you that this morning, that those gathered under the hearing of my voice be emptied of themselves and filled with the Holy Spirit. And I ask, Father, that you speak to our hearts today. And I ask, Father, that you challenge us, that your Holy Spirit brings conviction <clears throat> of sin and righteousness and judgment. And that you, Heavenly Father, show yourself mighty in our midst. Receive our worship. Answer our prayers. Comfort our hearts. Be glorified. Be honored. Be magnified through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning. God is good. All the time. I'd like to recognize a couple of people's groups right now real quickly, if I may. I think we had a great vacation Bible school this past week. And if you were serving in any capacity in vacation Bible school this week, would you please stand? We had five professions of faith in Bible school last week, in, in addition to the educational process that took place in every age group. Also, we had work day yesterday, and I came and worked a little while, and I got burned out. No. They ran me out of the kitchen, Pat and uh, Carolyn did, because uh, I wasn't doing anything properly. <laughs> but uh, I know Pat and Carolyn, BJ did a lot in the kitchen. If you work anywhere whatsoever yesterday in the work day, please stand and let us recognize you. Hey, I know you were. We're here, and you, and you, and you. Thank you. When's the next work day? I'll not put it on my, I'll put it on my calendar. Please remember the fellowship dinner this Wednesday evening, and the business meeting, and also hamburgers at the Hulses this coming Tuesday, Thursday, excuse me, Thursday at 6 p.m. If you'd like to ride the bus, several of you want to ride the bus from here, uh, Terry will leave about 5.30, and if you would, please make that uh part of your calendar for a Thursday. If you noticed a flyer in your bulletin today, it's about a concert that we're having this uh, Saturday evening at 6 o'clock. The Tribute Quartet is a national quartet. They've been on the Gaithers and they've been on several other uh, programs, a very well-known quartet. If you don't know them, they're not very well known, I guess. But uh, anyway, also before they sing, the Tribute Quartet sings, we'll hear Calvary's Harmony Quartet. And our church secretary's uh, husband, Josh, is a member of that quartet. So you make your plans to be here Saturday evening at 6 p.m. for the Tribute Quartet and the Calvary's Harmony Quartet. And I think you'll receive a blessing. If you're a guest this morning, we'd like to welcome you and hope that you receive a blessing. I hope that you were in Bible study this morning at 915. If you were not in Bible study this morning at 915, make a special effort to be there next Sunday morning at 915. If you're not sure what class you'll go, 
Gerald will meet you and show you to the place that you need to go. So if you're a guest this morning, would you please, if you haven't already, receive one of these worship bulletins. There's a place in here for you to fill it out and put your name and address and info there. And then when you tear it off, just leave it on the seat and we'll pick it up later. And if you're a guest, please remain seated. And church members, let's stand and greet one another.
count your blessings this morning. You know, our God is so good. He's so gracious and full of love and mercy. Let's just come this morning and praise Him and thank Him for all the things He's done for us this week. And ask Him to give us a wonderful time of worship. Would you pray with me, please? Our Lord and Savior, we bow before the throne of grace with humble and thankful and grateful hearts. Just thanking you and praising you for who you are, what you've done in our lives. Then, Father, you pour out your mercy and your love and your grace so abundantly on us each day of our lives. And we just come this morning to thank you and praise you. And remember the wonderful blessings that's ours each day of our lives. Now, dear Father, as we come today, we ask that your spirit would be in this place today in a mighty way. Then, Father, touch our hearts. Draw us closer to you. Speak to us today through our pastor. Then, Father, be with him. Deliver your words to a septic group of hearts that we might be drawn closer to you just by being in this place today. And then, Father, as part of that worship today, now we come to give back to you a portion that you so richly blessed us with. And as we do this joyfully, dear Father, we pray that you'd bless it. Use it for the ongoing of our kingdom around our community and around the world. For we ask all of these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 and singing indescribable and before we start this 
God is so amazing that in everything that He does, it's, it's indescribable from the tiniest flower blooming to the galaxies being spoken into existence. And we should stand in all of that, yet He takes the time to love us and look after us. And He can do anything He wants, but He loves us. Just remember that. Thank you.
seated. After the choir special is finished, Children's Church can, can go. Once again, it's good to be in God's house and good to be here in this pulpit sharing the Word of God. And um, I invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We continue in this chapter. We continue with this challenge that Paul uh, addressed to the Corinthians where he was warning them admonishing them, a better statement, admonishing them about the sectarianism that had come into the, into the church and their fierce competition. And they divided up into their camps, their camp of Apollos, their camp of Peter, their camp of Paul, and their camp of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's telling them Christ is not divided. He's not divided. We're going to begin in verse 5 and read some verses here. I want you to stand to your feet, please, as you find it. And the Word of God says this, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his labor. <clears throat> For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. 
According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, or stubble, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, him will God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Father, these words... These words speak to our heart, and we ask you, Father, that you teach us from these words today. And give me the ability to express this message according to the unction of the Holy Spirit. We thank you in the righteous name of Jesus. Amen. I want to remind each of us about a truth that is both wonderful and sobering at the same time. And here's that truth. Each one of us, all of us, will appear before Jesus the judge. We speak often of Jesus as the Savior, and we talk about Jesus as he comforts us and as he intercedes for us, the intercessor. But I tell you that we will stand before Jesus, and we will look at Judge Jesus one day, each one of us present will stand there. Many of us present today will stand at the judgment seat of Christ that you see described here in this passage and 2 Corinthians 5. Others will stand before Judge Jesus at the great white throne of judgment found in the book of Revelation. Christ followers that I've known throughout the years have protested when I've made this statement that you're going to stand before Judge Jesus. They said to me in protest, my sins were judged at Calvary. Can I tell you something? That's exactly right. Your sins were judged at Calvary. But your service has yet to be judged, and your service will be judged at the Bema, at the judgment seat of Christ. Second Corinthians 5.10 says, For we all, A-L-L, -L, every Christ follower, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give account of every thing of all of our works that we have done every one of us so you're not going to the judgment seat as a sinner you're going as a servant and as a son or a daughter of the Lord Jesus Christ now the works of those who are not Christ followers will be judged there at the great white throne of judgment in a later time. And in that later time, the books will be opened and another book will be opened. What are those books? Those books are the works of your life. Everything you do in this life is written down by Almighty God everything and God records it and those works will be will be read to you and the Lord God will then look for your name in the Lamb's book of life if it's not there you will spend eternity separated from God in the most horrible horrible place imaginable that lake of fire so when the Lord speaks to us he 
He speaks to us from three viewpoints and he looks at us in this passage from three viewpoints. He says three things about you and me. He says you are a field, you are a building, and you are the temple of the Lord. And he's going to poke and he's going to prod and he's going to inspect and he's going to test what's been sown in that field, what that building is built with, and what you have brought into the holy place of that temple. He's going to look at that and he wants you to be ready for that particular day. So I want to walk you through this passage of scripture and I want to show you what God says in this and we're going to begin with the field. I want you to see what God says about it. Now this is his statement. You are God's field. Paul was a southerner. Y'all are God's field. He's speaking to the church collectively. But listen to me. That applies to you individually as well. You are God's field. In our text that we have in front of us, Paul's emphasis in the text is this. It's twofold. Some work in the field. Some work in the field, and the second thing is, some water the field. But let me talk about that for just a few moments if I can. If you are a Christ follower, it's because someone worked in your field. Someone came along and sowed the seed of the Word of God into your field. And... Uh, Hey, this, this is the truth that I need you to understand because it's also possible that someone else came along and not only was the seed of the Word of God sown in your field, but you could have done it yourself or it could have been the influence of others, but somebody else may have sown worry into your field. Do you realize that? Somebody may have come along into your life and sown worry into your field. Worry. Worry. But somebody else may have come along and, and sown into your field that inward desire, that want for accumulation of wealth into your field. And they've sown in your field. And somebody's working in your field. And it might be Dr. Phil or it might be Rush or it might be somebody else. I don't know. I'm just throwing names that occurred to me of these radio yahoos and television yahoos out there. Could be Joel Osteen, you know, with his great big smile. I can't do that. I don't have enough of a mouth to... I would have to take exercises to get my mouth out that wide. And, and uh, they sow these things into our lives and you hear it over and over and over and after a while you say, yeah, yeah, I deserve that. And pretty soon, pretty soon that, uh, that, that, that sin nature brings out covetousness, covetousness in your life and you start wanting different things like that that, that normally you wouldn't be uh, chasing after. Well, I got to thinking about the field and I realized because that happens and because just any, you know, we, we have this danger of sowing in our own fields and uh, the wrong thing and others coming in and sowing into our own fields with the wrong things. We, we need to hoe the field. Now, how many of y'all have ever been on the proper end of the hoe before? Lift your hand. Isn't that fun? Isn't that just lovely to get out there? My daddy'd send me out, or my granddaddy, before we moved to Mississippi, and I spent my summers here. And I guarantee to you, if you ever want to go on a good strengthening and weight loss plan, you go to a chicken farm with 40 acres of vegetables also, and you get out there and you hoe and you shovel chicken manure into a spreader. Man, that'll a, that a build your strength. That'll build your character too. That'll build your water bill because you got to wash all that stuff off of you too. But listen to me, folks. You have to hoe those, you have to hoe in those gardens. If you don't, the weeds will take over in just a short amount of time. And so we'd get out and we'd have to be hoeing in those gardens. That's a worker in the field. That's what I'm doing right now, by the way. I've got my hoe out and, I, and I'm hoeing in somebody's garden today. The Holy Spirit's using me to do that for somebody's life. Some water those fields, as we've said. Now, we here depend upon the rains. <clears throat> there in the Middle East, they had, hello, they had 
It's the Lord calling. <laughs> they had semi-arid land and they needed, they needed irrigation. And so you had these fellas and as the, as the waters came by, they would open up, they built close to the water, and they would open up the channels there and let the water come in and irrigate in the field. And Paul said some worked in that field, some sowed in that field, and others came along and they watered that field. Can I tell you something? God sends to you faithful teachers and preachers to water the good seed that was sown in your life. Our VBS workers sowed and they watered in the field of those children this week and praise God for them. Our great Sunday school teachers, Bible school teachers, every week that goes by are watering the seed that's been sown in past times. Isn't that wonderful that those things go on? Some sow, some water, but you know what? It's God who gives the increase. Always. God who gives the increase. So you, ladies and gentlemen, according to the text that we've read, you are God's field. Not only that, you are God's building. You are God's building. When he speaks there in verse 9, he says, We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. And then he begins an elaborate description of building the building. And the first thing he begins with is the right foundation. You and I have the right foundation. If we're Christ followers, that is. Our faith is not the right foundation. Some folks think it's their faith that is the foundation. Well, folks, if you are building your life on your faith, can I tell you something? There are things that can come along and shatter your faith and shatter that, and it will shatter your foundation if that's so. The forefathers of the faith are not the right foundation. This is not built on Peter, Paul, or, or, or Kevin, or, or anyone else. I'm telling you, the church is built on one and only one foundation. Our feeble works are not the right foundation. The only foundation is the Father's only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the right foundation foundation ladies and gentlemen and your life if you are a Christ follower is built upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ you not only have the right foundation you have the right information Paul said he was a wise master builder isn't that a great statement that he made there the word master builder is the word for architect. An architect never builds anything without the right information. An architect works from a blueprint. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the blueprint of the Word of God. Every one of us present, God has given us a precious, inerrant, infallible Word that we can trust from Genesis to Revelation. You can trust every single bit of it there. You have the right information. Do you want to know the will of God? Start with the Word of God. Do you want to know what the future holds for you? Check the Word of God. Do you want to know the right person to marry? Look in the Word of God. Do you want to know the right job to have? Look in the Word of God. The Word of God gives you the right information for every single thing in your life. Not only that, you have the right occupation. You are a building, but you also a builder. The Bible says, verse 10, I believe it is, yeah, down towards the end of verse 10, let each one take heed how he builds on it. You are a builder. Now here's where it gets sticky, Drew. Here's where we get tough. Because it talks about two kinds of builders in this passage of Scripture. Some are carnal builders and some are spiritual builders when they build it. You say, preacher, I don't see that in there. Yes, you do. You just don't know it yet. When he talks about wood, hay, and stubble, he's speaking about 
carnal builders. When he speaks about gold, silver, and precious stones, he's speaking about spiritual builders. In this room right here today, each one of us is either a carnal builder or a spiritual builder. But I'm going to take it farther than that, Dale, because the truth of the matter is, each one of us has been, at some point, a carnal builder, and hopefully will be at some point, more often than not, a spiritual builder. Each one of us present. And you're building in your life right now. And you're building with wood, hay, and stubble. You're using the wood. You're taking the hay and the stubble, and you're making your mortar with the hay and the stubble, and you're building your building. And it looks fine, and it looks good, but when you expose it to fire, there's a problem. And the Bible says there's going to be a day that, that it's going to be exposed. We'll talk about that in a second. Now what am I talking about, wood, hay, and stubble, carnal builders and spiritual builders? Let me just elaborate for just a second on that if I can. There's one way that this happens when we talk about building carnally, building with wood, hay, and stubble. And then there, there's another way when we talk about uh, spiritual building. Uh, and, and, and I think it's this. I think it's this. When we start doing things out of self-effort for self-glory and self-gratification, then we're building carnally. Each one of us. When we stand up here, <clears throat> whether I'm preaching or somebody else is doing a solo, or they've joined the choir and they're singing in the choir, and by the way, some of y'all were missing today in the choir. When we do that, ladies and gentlemen, and we stand there and we're doing it so we can be noticed and we're not doing it to serve and honor the Lord, we're building with wood, hay, and stubble. When we do anything, when we even pray, and we spend time in prayer so that we can be noticed, Jesus said there were plenty of them that will stand on the street corners and lift their voice. When we do these things to be noticed, it's wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, and stubble. But when you're doing it for the Savior's effort, glory, and through His effort, and, and in His name, and, and to honor Him, then it's, then it's gold, silver, and precious stones. And when your life is lived so that Christ is honored, and so that Jesus is magnified, then your life exemplifies Jesus Christ. But now I've talked about just inside this room right here, I need to go farther than that, ladies and gentlemen, because the Bible says, whatever you do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, do it for the glory of Jesus Christ. So, so when you go to work tomorrow, when you leave this place and you, you, uh, you know, eventually get up tomorrow morning and you go on to your job or you go to your studies or whatever they may be and whatever you're involved in, you are to work as though you're working for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're doing it for your own personal gratification and your own personal recognition, ladies and gentlemen, I fear that you're building with wood, hay, and stubble. You say, well, preacher, I work because I want to support my family. Good, I hope you do. <laughs> I hope that that's one of the things that you have in your mind. But I know too many people that they spend their day whining about what they have to do. You know what I mean? And what I want to say, Larry, when I see folks like that, what I want to say is, you want some cheese with that wine? <laughs> you know? Uh, listen to me, folks. I mean, when we, when we live our life that way, and we live by the seat of our emotions, rather than to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, then I fear we're living and working with wood, hay, and stubble. Whatever you do, do to the glory of Almighty God. So you 
or a builder and a building, you have the right occupation, but you have the right declaration. Far be it from me to look at your life and to say, you, you have built with this and you have built with that. As a matter of fact, Nick, I'll tell you this, buddy. Uh, when it comes to preaching the Word of God, I think a fellow that just runs out and steals somebody's sermon has just preached and built with wood, hay, and stubble, even if it sounds great. Amen? Man, I'm telling you, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to do that. I think when we only stick to the Bible stories and we don't go into the Bible doctrines, we're building with wood, hay, and stubble. I can't discern what you've built with, and you can't discern what I've built with, but the day of the judgment seat of Christ, they're going to take everything we've done, and it's going to be tried by fire. Where's that fire? Revelation 1 says that the eyes of Jesus are fire. They are a fire. Read that in Revelation 1. I didn't make that up. It's right there in the Word of God. And the Lord very pointedly and very specifically tells us that he's looking at our lives and he is, he is going to take everything in the judgment seat of Christ. When does that happen? Well, I can tell you this. It happens after the rapture of the church. And uh, I think it's going to happen sometime during that seven-year tribulation that's going on here on the earth and we're in heaven. I think it happens before the marriage supper of the Lamb, which happens there towards the end of the tribulation period while things are going on here on the earth, um, you know, during the tribulation, the great tribulation. Which, by the way, uh, let me just say this while I'm talking about the, the judgment seat of Christ. You know, you think the best is yet to come. I got news for you. The worst is yet to come for this world and for this earth. And there are going to be some horrible, horrible days on this planet uh, before Jesus comes back and sets foot on this planet. But we're going to be there, and we're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to look straight into our eyes, and his eyes are going to be the fire by which our works are judged. And if they burn up, they burn up. If they're wood, hay, and stubble, they will burn up. If they're gold, silver, and precious stones, they will remain. Those works will remain, every one of them. And the Lord says... But you will be saved, even if it's by fire, you're going to be saved. Now that's a sad thing though, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, because he's not finished with the text, and this is, this is why I'm preaching such a broad passage, because rightfully I could preach three sermons out of what I'm telling you today, but I see... I see a connection between this because he put these three statements in there. You are God's field. You are God's building. And you are God's temple. You are God's temple. Why did he put these three things? And I, I went through this in my mind and I, I pondered this and, 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 and I think it's because... I, well, I don't know every reason why, but I think it's because this describes the church in terms that otherwise are not described in the Bible. Now, the sin of many of the Old Testament kings was the defilement of the temple. And how did they do it? They filled it with all kinds of idols, false idols from other lands. That's what they did. I need to tell you something about the temple before we get into that, though. I need to tell you this. First of all, the word for temple in this passage is not the same one found in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, What, do you not know that you were the temple of the Holy Spirit? You remember that? And that's what you hear, and that's what your mind probably went to right now. And uh, I understand that, and it's okay. But there, by the way, <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 6.19, he's using a singular. Do you not know that you individually are the temple? In other words, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body. This thing right here. Everybody's individual body who is a Christ follower, his body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he uses one word for temple there. But he uses another word for temple in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where he says you are the temple of God. 
And he uses that word there and he speaks in a collective way. Y'all are the temple of God. He's speaking about the church. The church is the temple of God. And the word he uses is nous. You won't say that like a good Greek. You'd say naos. And uh, that particular word, that particular word refers to the holy place of the temple. And you are the holy place. You are God's holy place. What did Jesus say in Matthew 18 where two or three are gathered in my name? There am I in their midst. We are God's holy place. Temple Baptist Church, Hardy Street Baptist Church, Westminster Presbyterian, Parkway Heights, Methodist. Just start thinking of the churches that you know these are God's holy place. Not this building we're in, although we've sanctified this building and dedicated this building. You, us, we together are God's temple. And he warns us, look at this passage. Verse 16, do you not know that you are the temple of God? The Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which you are. How do we defile the temple? Because you see, that's the big question that we have before us. How do we defile the temple called the church? This is the whole thing that Paul's preaching in this passage. This goes back because he ties it up with the last verses, 18 through 23. He ties up there. He connects it all together with everything he said about this. And so he's put this here, the Holy Spirit has, for a specific purpose. Some defile the temple with dis. Unity, which is the main point that Paul was making in this passage of Scripture. You guys are not in unity, he said to the Corinthians. You've got a problem with this. Some defile it with disrespect. Y'all remember Diotrephes? You remember that great name, Diotrephes? John told one of the churches that he wrote to, I wanted to come see you, but Diotrephes, who loves the preeminence, would not receive me. Some disrespect. I've got to tell you this story real quickly, and pardon the personal illustration. I won't tell you where it comes from, but I was in one particular pastorate a number of years ago, and um, there was a situation that arose with a moral issue in the church. I won't describe that moral issue. It's not important to the conversation. But um, there were some hurt feelings over that moral issue because as pastor I took a specific stand against that kind of immorality that was trying to raise its head and be glorified in the church. And a lady called me on the telephone. And she began to let me know just exactly what she thought of my stance over that moral issue. Y'all, immorality has no place in the church, period. And when you celebrate immorality, even worse. Amen? Why, we'll see that when we get to chapter 5 of this passage. Why, they were celebrating the immorality of one of the men of the church. And I wasn't about to allow such a thing to take place where I was. And she said, she said, I don't like what you said. I don't believe what you said. And I said, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. And then she said this. You don't scare me. I said, well, I'm glad to know this. But she growled it when she said it. You don't scare me. And I thought, woof, woof. I said, I'm sorry you feel that way. She said, I am about to make your life miserable. You will see. Well, she tried. But you start messing with God's church, God doesn't like that too much. 
And some people defile the church with disrespect. I want to tell you one of the signs of apostasy, by the way, is disrespecting authority. I'm nobody. Y'all hear that? But the office of pastor is something. And when you disrespect the office of pastor, you're in danger. Let God deal with that man if he's wrong. Amen? And he will deal with an inerrant pastor. Believe me. I mean an errant pastor. I almost said that wrong, didn't I? I'm not the Pope. Uh, (laughs) He will do it. Some do it with disrespect. Some do it, ladies and gentlemen, not with disrespect. They do it with dissension. And so all they do is they create dissension arguments around. And dissension with what God is doing only happens when we're determined to have our own way, by the way. Dissension arises out of selfishness. Always has, always will. Some defile it with dishonor. And what I'm talking about is that your life and lifestyle dishonors Christ and the church. You're great here. You show up with smile on your face. You get home. You bark at your kids. You kick your dog. You throw the cat into the tree. And you're just mean as a junkyard dog. And you dishonor the church. I want to tell you something. Every time we who claim to be Christ followers, yield to some kind of sin, we have dishonored the church. We have brought defilement into the church. And guys, some defile it with disease. And by that I mean false teaching. gets into the church. I've got to say it again. I have to say it one more time to our Bible teachers. I have to say this. You be careful who you watch on these television shows and who you listen to on these radio shows because 80% of them are heretics and teach false doctrine. I left one man's house I don't see him here in this uh, service today, but I left his house one day and I made it to the uh, uh, interstate and I said, I'll believe I'll see what's on the radio and the guy on the radio who sounded as eloquent a man as I'd ever heard in my life, about five minutes into it, he proceeded to explain why there is no such place as hell, that hell does not exist. I thought, shades of Rob Bell. Man, he's defiling the temple of God with disease, with false teaching. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. If you question, I mean, if you think I'm teaching something falsely, please come to me. Because I pray God that he take my life before I defile his temple with false teaching. There was a man one time, he had two sons, it's a true story, one of the sons was always, you know, compliant, y'all know what I'm talking about, you've had children and you just tell them to do this and they do it and you tell them don't do that and they don't do it and then you have that other child that says, I'll show you and he had both children that way. Well, the younger son, the compliant one, came to Christ at an early age and eventually became a preacher, a world-renowned preacher. I'm not going to call his name, but you might recognize it if I did, but I'm not going to call his name. And he was known all over the globe, and he was such a preacher. And I would listen to him. Every opportunity I had, I would listen to him. I could only listen either by tape or by radio, but I, I had my... Radio, and I had my copies of his messages, this man. And he himself was telling the story. And he told the story of how later in life, his brother, his older brother, the rebellious one, 
The one who lived for himself all these years and rejected Christ all of these years came down with lung cancer. And when he was diagnosed with inoperable lung cancer, he called for his brother who lived here by then in the United States and his brother flew back to London to see his dying brother. The preacher brother stood by his dying brother and he, his brother said, do you suppose there's any hope for a man like me? And he said, well yes, there's hope for a man like you. Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus died for your sins. And the rebellious dying brother finally gave his heart to Jesus Christ. About three weeks passed and the preacher was still over there. So he went by to see his brother. And he went into the hospital and he found his brother there. Laying in the bed hours from death. But he was sobbing. He was weeping. And he said, well... I don't understand this. And you know, you have hope in Christ Jesus. You, you have eternal life. Did, didn't you receive Him as your Savior? Didn't you repent and believe on the Lord? He said, oh yes, that's, that's not it. That's not it. He said, well then please, why are you crying? Is it because pretty soon we're going to be parted and, and I won't see you here, but I'll see you in heaven? He said, that's not it. I said, well, please tell me what is going on. He said, it's because I'm going before the Lord empty-handed. I have nothing to offer Him. I'm going empty-handed. I've wasted my life and I have nothing to offer the Lord. We are God's field. But some of us as Christ followers have sown other seed in that field. And the field is taken up with the wrong things. We are God's building. But some of us have built with wood, hay, and stubble. And when it's tried in the fire, it's going to burn up. And we'll have nothing to offer the Lord. We are God's temple. But some of us have brought things into that temple that has dishonored that temple. And God says to us, The day's coming. When you stand before me, I'm going to try what's in your life. Now we have the opportunity this morning to repent of those things that maybe the Holy Spirit brought up into our minds. And we can take these steps and turn it into a place of prayer and repent. Now listen to me. I know you can do it right where you are. I know this. But what a difference it makes for the church and for your commitment when you make your repentance and reconciliation with God a public thing. We used to use the word, Nick, recommitment. I was talking with my brother one day. I think fresh surrender is a better word. Because commitment's action on our part. We need to surrender and get under his authority. And it needs to be a fresh surrender of our lives as Christ followers. Amen. I think I'm going to try to coin that in my mind and begin to use that in our invitations. And it's time for a fresh surrender on the part of some of y'all. It's time for somebody who's present to 
It's time for somebody who's present to turn from your sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and receive Him as Lord and Savior. Receive Him into your heart. Receive Him into your life. And if you don't know how, we have people all over this building that can show you how, and we will. But I'll need you to come forward and say, like one man did a few months ago, I know I need to be saved, I just don't know how. And we took the Word of God and showed them how to be born again. And we've baptized them here since then. But God's speaking to somebody about that today. And you need, to, you need to step out this morning. You need to come forward and you need to say, you're talking about me, I need Christ today. And God has spoken to some, this is your place that you should be serving. And you should transfer your membership here. And God's spoken to you about that. And you should do that. And be obedient. For the glory of Jesus Christ. And for his honor.